Saturday Crafternoons. I'm your host, Leah, and... And I'm your host, Samir. Um, welcome. Uh, we are from Assemble, and Assemble is located in the lovely Garfield neighborhood in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yeah, and Assemble is a community space for arts and technology. And today we have the artist, Jenna. Yay. Hi. Hi, Jenna. How are you today? <laughs> I'm I'm doing well, thank you, Samir. Yeah, it looks like you're in your studio. That looks like a fun little spot. Yeah, this is our um, our art dungeon. So I share this space with my two sons, um, four. They're um, four and six, and so we do all of our creating in this quarter of our um, very Pittsburgh basement. Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we have a couple questions for you today. Um, okay. The first little question we have is just, what are you passionate about? Okay, that's a great question. I am super passionate about bringing the arts to everyone. So I teach classes from the littlest kids, um, you know, 18 months, two years old, all the way up to um, grownups. And a lot of times people ask me what's my favorite age group and I just don't have one um, because I really feel like the art is a bridge way to all learning um, and an engagement. So it just gets people interested in things. Um, and it's talking about art and making art and looking at art and exploring art. And I really just love experimenting um, with all art materials. And I, I'm the first person to say that I'm not an expert in this particular thing. Let's explore it together. Um, or maybe I've done this thing 25 times, but let's try it in a new way. Um, and I really think that art can build confidence. And the, the thing that kind of breaks my heart is whenever I see a student of any age say, I can't draw that, or I'm not good at this. Um, and that really shouldn't be the goal. The goal should just be to explore and to create something that you're really proud of and something that's interesting to you. So that's my passion is just kind of bringing that accessibility to artists of all ages. I love, I love that. that. Yeah, <laughs> I um, I really think that it's something whenever a student can teach you too. Mm -hmm. That always is like those like yes moments. <laughs> right, right. Sometimes I do the same project like five times in one day with different age groups, mm -hmm. and they're like, "Well, what happens if I do this?" And then I'm like, "I don't know. Let's do it together." And then yep. for the next class, I'm like, "Hey, someone just showed me something great from this last time." So again, no matter how many times I do um, I experience a process or a project. I'm always learning something new from my students. And I think that that's just really fun. Yeah, and for those of you who've never been to Assemble before, one of our mottos is actually building confidence through making. Mm -hmm. right. um, so that's like really cool, that we're just connected mm -hmm. like that. Right, <laughs> what's the connections? All right, well, I have some silly questions for you. Um, okay. So I've been thinking about like scents a lot. One of my favorite scents is like fire. Like I love like a fireside. Um, mm -hmm. So what is your favorite scent and why? Okay, well, I, lavender is just like a smell that I really love. Um, and my kids kind of make fun of me and my husband because I just kind of like spray it <laughs> all over the place. And I, my, I'm really into smelling things and so are my sons. So um, anytime we um, have gone to a store, we all kind of smell the candles together. And anytime I'm feeling stressed out or I'm feeling a little bit down, just lighting a candle or like spraying a smell or even using the pencil sharpener and getting the pencil shavings, like scents just kind of bring me back to earth and just make me feel a lot better. So I really like a lot of different smells. Yeah. That's a good one. It kind of reminds me whenever you open up like a crayon container and you get that right. nostalgic smell oh, of crayon. Oh, Play-Doh smell yeah. is just yeah. like my jam. I love Play-Doh smell. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Those are some good scents. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have one other funky question for you. Um, if you could be any art supply, what would you be? What, what do you identify with? If I could be any art supply. Okay, well, I am 100% obsessed with liquid watercolor. Um, I just have been since um, I think I was probably introduced to that material when I first started working at the Carnegie Museum of Art, probably like 15 years ago. I didn't know about it, right? Watercolor is supposed to be in those pans. Um, so it just kind of blew my mind. 
Um, so ever since then, I like to introduce that material to everyone. So again, like my two-year-olds do it, my adults do it. Um, I love using little pipettes and eyedroppers. I love making them explode. Um, I love dripping. I love everything about them. So I love to use liquid watercolor in my um, teaching and also in my personal art practice. Um, and I just think they're so magical um, and just do what they want to do. And so I think it would be really fun to be liquid watercolor. Yeah. <laughs> it would be fun, like someone just dropping you onto a piece of page. And so right, and you just bloom out, <laughs> right? And you just like splatter everywhere. I'm, I would be totally fine with that. It's free and flowing. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Awesome. Well, great answers. So thank you so much, Jenna, and we can't wait to see what, what you make with us. Thank you. I'm so excited to make with everyone. Awesome. Let's go check out what Jenna has for us today. Hi, friends. It's Miss Jenna. Today I'm going to give you some strategies on how to create a portrait using proportion and anatomy. You're going to choose a neighbor or a family member to create that portrait of and you're going to show us how you really feel about that person with an expressive background using color and technique. We're going to be creating an artwork with three major components. The expressive background using watercolor experiments, also the portrait using a face template to talk about general face proportions and anatomy, and then oil pastel to color it. Now this is an artwork talking about just general proportions. So what a person might look like if they had sort of like perfect proportions, which is not really something that we want to do. This is a general person. This person doesn't exist. What I want to do instead is to use a photograph of someone that I care about and respect or someone that I'm interested in. And it could be a celebrity or a part of your community or a, a family member. And that's what I'm going to do instead. So I have a photograph of my grandmother. who I haven't been able to see for almost a year in person. And I really would like to do a portrait of her instead. To get started, you're going to need a piece of colored paper. Um, I have some paper that's cardstock, so it's just a little bit thicker than regular drawing paper. Um, I have yellow, any color can do. If you have white, that would also work. I also have the space template. And the face template is nice because it gives me an idea of where I need to start. It has all of the components of the face. I have the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. Um, and it's also putting all of the features of the face kind of where they are in the head. And I, I like to refer back to my skull. Now this is not a real skull, it's a plastic skull but I like to have it around because it reminds me of what's going on underneath the face. And we'll talk about that a lot too. But we have the eyes that are actually in the center of our head, which sometimes is a little bit confusing because our hair makes it seem like it's up higher, but it's actually right in the center of our skull. We have our nose, which if you were to move it around on your face, you'll notice it's really bendable because it's cartilage and it, there aren't actually any bones on the outside. Um, part of our face. But you can see that there's a cavity that goes on the inside and then we have our mouth here. So basically we have our three main things in the middle of the head and the second part of the third here and the bottom third of our face. I'm going to place my face template on my page so that I have some room, a little bit of room for um, the bust of the person, so the neck and the shoulders. If you go up higher, then you'll have more of the body. If you go down lower, then you'll have a little bit less of the body. I don't want to have so much of the body, but I think I'll put my face just about in the center of my paper. I'm going to hold my paper down and trace all the way around with a pencil. I don't want to press down too hard with my pencil because these are just my preliminary marks and I might want to cover them up a little bit later. Now, I have all of the features in the center of the face. So um, this person's looking directly at me. But in my reference photograph of my grandmother, you can see the center of her face is actually moved a bit to the side. It's not quite three quarters view, but it's just a little bit more than that. So I'm going to take my face template away. And instead of drawing the face, um, the lines right in the center of the face, I'm going to move them just slightly to the side. So I'm going to put 
um, just a little bit of a mark um, off center from the face so I know where I want to put that center line. I have my ruler. You don't have to have a ruler. You can use a straight edge or you could just draw the line the best that you can. So I'm going to draw my center line just a little bit off center from the face because that's what my reference photograph is saying. I do want to put the eye line though right in the center of the face horizontally. So I'm going to use my face template as a guide and I'm just going to put a little mark next to the center line here and a little mark next to the other center line. I'm also going to put a, a mark next to the nose line and a mark next to the mouth line. And I can use my straight edge to follow those guides. There's my eyes, my nose, and my mouth. So now I'm going to get started with the features of the face. So our eyes, for the most part, like on our guide, are kind of like an almond shape. But if you are looking in the mirror at your own eyes or any uh, the eyes of your neighbors, we know that not everyone's eyes are the same. Um, everyone's completely different. So again, I'm going to look at my photograph of my grandmother, and I'm just going to do a nice soft line on my guide. So I'm going to do half of the eye above the line, and I'm going to do half of the eye below the line. And I'm just using nice soft marks because this is just my preliminary mark and I might wanna change it just a little bit later on. So I have my eyes shape on both sides of the line. Now our eyes are made up of multiple parts. It's not just the outside line, but I also want to talk about the center of my eye. So I want to draw my iris, and the iris is the colored part of our eye. And I'm, it's a, a perfect circle in the middle, but we don't get to see all of the iris because it's, it's covered up with the outside of our eyelid. So I'm just going to draw, look again, looking at my photograph, kind of where the iris is in the eye. We also have the pupil, which is the black circle of our eye. And our pupil, wherever you draw it on your eye, is really going to show where this person's looking. So I'm having the portrait look right at me, right in the center. So I have the pupils in the center. If you want your person to be looking at the side, then you would draw your pupil on each side, looking in whatever direction you want. But you do want the pupils to be in the same place in the eye, because otherwise, then the person's going to look all cross-eyed, like they're looking at different places, like a chameleon. So you do want it to be in the same place in both eyes. Now the pupil dilates or opens and closes and allows the light to come in. So if you have your pupils that are really, really large, then that would be saying that this person's in a space that there is not very much light. Or if they're really, really tiny, then that's somewhere, um, there's somewhere where it's really light. But I'm going to have mine just kind of middle-sized in the center of my eye, nice and light. Now we also have the eyelid. And the eyelid is kind of like an umbrella for our eye. And it protects our eye from sweat and debris. It also allows our eyes to close, to blink, and to sleep. So it's a really important part of our face. My grandmother's eyelids are a little bit closer to the eyes, um, but usually on someone who um, is a little bit younger and their skin's more elastic, then it's going to be up a little bit higher. So it really just depends who you're drawing on where your eyes, sh your eyelids should be. There's also eyelashes, and our eyelashes also protect our eye. They're like little brooms that shoot up from our eyes to keep our eyes safe. Now our, eye our eyelashes, there are thousands of them. There are just so many of them. And a good trick would also be to draw them kind of rate as a radial. So I have on the outside, they're going to swoop to the side. And as I go up higher and in the center, then they go straight. And when they go to the other side, they swoop to the other side. And what that's doing is it's showing the audience that my eye is actually three dimensional and it's not flat. And so that's a really good trick to make your eyes look nice and three dimensional and pop off of 
the page. So I have my eyelid, I have my eye, I have my iris, which is the colored part of the eye, and I have the pupil right in the center, my eyelashes here. Next, I need my eyebrows, which again is a protector of our face. And they go all the way from the one side of our eye all the way to the other side of our eye. Again, they're made up of thousands of little hairs, but to start, I'm just going to do the general shape so I know where to place them on my face. And then I can make some little hairs by just moving my pencil back and forth, back and forth, just nice and soft. Again, looking at my photograph to see, to really observe what the shape of the eyebrows are. Next is our nose. And our nose can be really, really trick to draw, tricky to draw. And on our template, you see that I just have the nostrils. I didn't even draw the, all of the outside of our, of our nose. And that's because again, our nose is cartilage and it moves around and around and it's bendy. And so really we're just kind of drawing the shadow that's being created on our face. But I do start with the nostril because it's the part that we can really see on the nose. And because my grandmother's portrait's nearly three quarters, I really only see the one nostril really well. And I'm going to look down on, I'm going to use proportion, so where things are in relation to the other objects on their face, and see where it is on my grandmother's portrait. Now in the photograph, I see that the nostril, if I were to draw a line straight up, is hitting the corner of my grandmother's eye. So that's where I'm going to place it. I'm going to place it right down on the line, on my nose line. I'm going to add one nostril. And then on the other side, I'm going to add the nostril where it is too. So again, that's because my grandmother's portrait's not in the center. The nostrils are a little bit off center as well. And the nostril is just the hole in our nose. And next I need to do the flaps of our nose. And so the flap here, because she's smiling, is up just slightly from the nostril on each side. So I drew my little flaps on each side of the nostril. And now I'm going to do the bottom part of the nose. And I'm going to look at my photograph and I can see that her nose, the tip of her nose is coming down past the nose line and then the flaps go up a little bit higher. Now that I have the nose flaps on each side, I can follow the bridge, the nose all the way up to the bridge, which connects to our eyebrow. And so I'm going to draw my line all the way up, swooping to the top of the eyebrow. And on the other side, I can see that it kind of dips in whoop, and goes all the way up and hugs all the way up to the eyebrow. Again, I'm just looking at my photograph to really give me a guide and inspiration on where these parts go. Because my grandmother is smiling, she has something called these smile lines on the side of her face, which is actually really, really helpful for an artist because it helps us figure out where the parts of the face go. So I'm going to um, use those as a guide and I'm going to follow them. I see it comes from the side of the flaps of my nose here and it goes to the side of the face and then it's coming down. So I'm going to go ahead and do that over here and down to where my mouth line is. Next, I'm going to draw the top of the lip. Now I'm going to use the center line to, to really help me figure out where that goes. The center line is really the center of our mouth. And I can see my grandmother's mouth is open a little bit and the shape is coming up and it's coming up. So her smile is minimal. So it's just curving up just slightly and that's where the center of her mouth is. Now her lips are a little bit thin again because she's smiling. So it's almost like, again, curving like an umbrella, hugging the top part of the mouth. And then the side, the bottom of the mouth, I can see there's the, there are these little angles pointed down and then we have the line coming across. So everyone's lips are gonna be totally different, just like all of the features of her face, but also very much depending on if the person is smiling or if they're not smiling. Now you notice there's very little of the face left 
And again, that's because I'm drawing a very specific person and this is just a guide. But I'm going to now add to the sides of the face to make it more specific to the person that I'm also drawing, my community member. So I'm going to use this photograph to help me figure out that the chin actually comes down below my template chin and the cheeks actually come up to the sides. And now this is a little bit more specific to the person that I'm drawing. And I can come back with an eraser and erase those guidelines if I want to, or I can leave them there because I'm going to be using oil pastel, which will really help um, cover up some of those marks that I don't want. Also, I want to figure out where the neck is. And what's really going to be helpful for me for that is to figure out the ears. And when I look at my um, photograph here, because it's a printout I can draw on it, I'm going to draw a straight line from the bottom of her ear all the way over, and I see that's the center of her mouth. The top of her ear is covered by her hair, but I can guess, and it looks like it's at the top of the eyebrow. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to draw the bottom of my, no of my ear, and I'm going to draw a little flap, like a little smiley face going up, and then at the top, I'm going to draw another little smiley, or a little frowny face, actually, because it's upside down. And I'm just going to connect the two. Again, it's not a really specific shape yet. I'm just drawing my general shape to help me figure things out. And then I know that my neck actually goes kind of behind that ear. And so I'm going to draw my line coming down and then my shoulder off to the side. And that, again, that's using proportion to help me figure out where all of those elements are. Next, I'm just going to draw the swoop of her shirt coming down. So I want to cover up um, my portrait with hair here. I see can see where the hair is in relation to some of the other objects in the face. I can see that her hair is coming all the way down almost to her eyebrows on the one side and the other side is kind of coming down to her eyebrow on the side and covering up her ear and again because this is the top of the skull and the hair is growing out of the hair it's going the hair is going to go above the skull and down now at this point you can compare your drawing to your face and figure out, okay, what other elements am I missing? And I'm going to go ahead and kind of change some of my general drawing to be a little bit more specific to my um, photograph. And I'm going to kind of change the shape a little bit of the eye. I can see that I have my eyes a little too wide open and I'm gonna make them a little bit smaller. And I'm going to add some of these other elements just to make it look a lot more like the person that I'm drawing. Now this is an inspiration portrait. And what I mean by that is I'm really not so worried about capturing exactly what this person's looking like. I want to use my photograph as inspiration and capture their likeness but I'm not worried about recreating the photograph. The photograph already exists. I want to create an artwork. And the next part of our, um, of our art making, adding the color to the person and also adding the color to the background is really going to help capture um, how this person makes me feel or their personality. And I'm really a little bit more concerned with that than making it look exactly like the person that I'm drawing. So now that I have most of the elements of the face here, I can move on to color. To add the color of the face, I'm going to be using oil pastel. And oil pastel, well, they're similar to crayons, except they have um, a lot of oil on the inside. It's oil solvent. And so it is nice and creamy and they mix together really, really well, which is really the main reason that I really love to use them. Now, again, you can use color in an expressive way. So uh, what I mean by that is it does not have to be realistic. You don't have to be following exactly what you see. So I could make her face purple or I could make it green. 
I can do whatever I want, whatever I feel inspired by, or I can try to recreate some of the colors that I see in the photograph. And I'm going to start with three main colors. I'm going to do a medium, a light, and a dark. I'm going to start with a medium to really cover up the portrait um, and it's going to also help me mix all of the colors together by kind of covering most of the portrait in one color. My grandmother's face is kind of like a peachy tone. There's some pinks, there's some oranges. Um, so I think I'm going to start, um, I think I might start with pink as my kind of medium color to kind of help me out. And I'm going to use the side of my oil pastel because it's going to help me cover a little bit more space. And I'm not just gonna cover right on top of everything that I've drawn, but I am going to color on top of some of the, um, the marks that I made, the guidelines, uh, because that's not something that I really want to be part of my final drawing. So I'm going to go on, go on top of those lines, but I'm not going to go on top of my eyes, or my nose or the features of the face. I have my entire face, neck and ears covered in that middle tone that I chose, which was the pink. The next thing that I want to do is to find the light areas of the face and highlight those. And I chose the light areas of the face because my grandmother's face here has a lot of light area. She's in a light, sunny space. If your picture photograph has a lot more dark areas, then you might want to start with dark. But I'm going to start with my light, and I'm going to choose a light color. I think I'll choose this peachy color here. Um, I might also go back and forth between the light. So I'm going to look on the face, and I'm going to add some light areas. So the light areas are going to be all the areas of the face that are the highest. So we have the nose, which is coming off of our face. And so it's a much, much lighter area because the light is able to find it much faster because it is closer to the light. Now, after you have some of your lights down, you're going to want to go to your dark. Now, I think that I'm going to use like this brown color to do my darks, and I might come back and actually do some purple too. But I'm gonna, going to use these two as my darks for now. Now that I have my middle in my light and my dark areas of the face, I can also use my light as sort of a blending stick. If I feel like some of those colors maybe aren't integrated so well, I wanna kind of experiment with mixing some of those together, then I can use my oil pastel to kind of bring all of those colors together. Another way that you can blend the colors, you can use your finger. What you really want to do is go inside of some of those features of the face like the eyes and the mouth and the nose and start to add some of those colors because right now I just have them all with a background color. You can also go ahead on the hair and add some of your colors but again don't forget about that medium, that dark, and the light and make sure that you're using that in the hair as well. I'm all finished adding oil pastel color to my portrait. You can see that I covered all of the areas, even the clothing and the hair and the mouth. If you have any designs on the clothing, you can do that. If you wanna add earrings or any jewelry or any other accessories or details, you can go ahead and add that too. I really had a lot of fun exploring with the colors in the face especially. I discovered some colors that I did not first notice in the photograph and I added some colors of my own. I also cut out my portrait because we're going to be adding it to the background. Next, you want to get out the background paper that you're going to be using. I have a painting paper. You can use watercolor paper or a thick cardstock. I'm using white because I'm going to be adding color with paint. And I wanted to put my portrait on top 
to decide where I want to place it in the end because I already have these hard edges. I'm placing mine all the way at the bottom and it's hugging the bottom tight here. You want to hold it down and trace it very lightly with some pencil. And that's so that I know whenever I'm painting that this space is going to be covered up with my portrait. So maybe I'm not going to be painting this area as much as I'm going to be painting the other areas. For the background, I'm going to be using watercolor paints. You can really use any materials you have on hand, markers, you can even collage with paper, anything that you really want. For the watercolor though, I have my palette. I have some water in a cup. I have some paint brushes. And for experimenting, I also have a spray bottle and I have some table salt that I just put in this jar. To get started, I think I'm going to make my paper nice and wet so I can experiment what will happen if I add some paint to my wet paper. Maybe on um, the right side, I'll add some water and I'll leave the other parts dry. When I'm choosing colors, I'm thinking about the person that I'm painting. Uh, I know that my grandmother's, some of her favorite colors are green and yellow, so maybe I'll keep that in mind. Also thinking about some colors um, that come to mind when I'm thinking about my grandmother. My grandmother is very calm, she's very cool, She's very nurturing. Um, I have that kind of warm, fuzzy feeling when I think about her. And um, it just so happens that green's also my favorite color. So I'm adding some green to my paper. And I'm adding the green here to the wet paper on the side. Maybe I'll add some green to the dry side of my paper and see how that's different. And I'm noticing that the paint on the dry side is a little bit brighter than the other side that was already wet. Maybe I'll grab some darker greens and I'm really, really swishing around my wet brush and my watercolor palette. And I'm going to start adding some little dots. And if you look really closely at the paper, when I'm adding my paint to the wet areas, you can see that the paint is starting to expand and follow that water and that's called blooming. And that's really fun in watercolor, how the paint really kind of does what it wants to do. It's really following the water. So even though I'm intentionally adding paint in some areas, it's kind of fun to see what the paint does on its own. On top of dripping and mixing colors, maybe I'll add a little bit of splattering and I'm going to really, really, really add lots of paint to this paintbrush and lots of water and maybe go back and forth, back and forth. And I'm going to do a controlled splatter because I don't want it all over me and all over my clothes and all over the floor and the ceiling. So I have my nice full brush. I'm going to hold it to the side horizontally above my paper. I have a nice firm hand at the back of my brush and I'm going to just um, bend it slightly down toward the paper. I'm going to tap, 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 tap. And it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much energy to really make it splatter outward. I love splattering. I think it's really fun. I really like the way it looks. You can see when it hits the side that was more dry, it's kind of maintaining its shape a little more. When it's hitting the side that was really wet, it's kind of exploding outward. So it's not just a bloom, it's kind of like a paint explosion. just holding my paper up and down so that it's almost standing and I'm dropping the water on top I'm just kind of dotting it with the paint and it's just kind of rolling downward and collecting all of the paint that was left behind I'm also going to experiment with a little bit of salt I'm going to choose an area of my painting that is really wet and I'm just sprinkling the salt on the surface. And what that does is the salt starts to absorb all of the water. It's trying to, it's greedy. It just wants to eat all of that water up. And so when it dries, it creates these beautiful crystals because it's collecting all the water and the water has the paint inside. So it's grabbing all of it and it's leaving a really cool shape behind. And I really think that's quite beautiful. So I really, ex I really encourage you to experiment with your color mixing, to add layers and layers on top, 
to really think about the person that you're recreating and become inspired with how you feel about them and how they make you feel. You know, like, is it like my grandmother where you feel just kind of warm and you feel loved and, and you feel protected? Maybe think about that person's house. Is it warm? Do you play with that person? Um, are they really bold? Are they energetic? And how does that translate to color? Are they more of an orange? Are they a green or a blue or a yellow? So really just think about that as inspiration and experiment and explore. Another tool that you can add to your experimenting toolbox here is a spray bottle. I want to make sure that it has water inside and that whenever I spray it, it's a mist and not a stream. So it's kind of spreading out. And I can spray my surface. And again, if you look really closely, if I zoom in here, then I can see that the water is displacing some of the paint and it's spreading out and it creates this really beautiful stippling. So again, it's a mixture of you adding the paint purposefully, but then also being open to some exploration using your water and your salt and your dripping and your splattering as a way to create some things that are not intentional, but are incredibly beautiful. The last step of our portrait project is to add our portrait to our background. So you want to wait for your background to be nice and dry, depending on how, you, how wet you made it when you were creating, you might need to let it dry overnight. I want to turn my portrait upside down and grab a glue stick. And I want to really load the background of this portrait with lots and lots of glue. to put your portrait down right where your lines were you want to press if it doesn't stick right away do not worry about it because I would suggest that you add some heavy books on top of your portrait and you're going to let that sit for at least 30 minutes but maybe even overnight so that you can make sure that your portrait and your background are bound together and that they're not going to move anywhere and there you have your portrait based on your community member and your expressive background. Thanks for creating with me today. I really hope you had fun, you made some discoveries, and you're really proud of what you made. Thanks so much for joining us this week for Saturday Crafternoon. We would love to see what you've created. To do so, please share by posting on our Facebook page, tagging us on Instagram, at assemblepgh or email me at my email leah at assemblepgh.org and if you enjoyed this video and want to hear from us again be sure to hit that subscribe button before you go